Can everybody see that? Looks good. Let's see if it works. Here it goes. Okay. <clears throat> Sounds good. Anyway, the objectives of this talk is going to be going over the understanding of what's the history behind what we're doing for ACLs right now, both from the surgical procedure and the rehabilitation. As people may or may not know, I use patellar tendon grafts, but about 30 years ago, I started using the patellar tendon graft from the opposite knee, which I can go over because that's been a huge step in the development of our ability to do a better job. I'm going to go over the rehabilitation in all phases, preoperatively, after surgery, uh, midterm returning to sports. And I'm going to go over the short-term outcomes of ACLs as far as short-term range of motion, return to sports, re-injuries. And then we have a particularly great long-term outcomes. We have over 900 patients that have come back to see us more than 10 years after their surgery so we can correlate how their short-term outcomes relates to their long-term outcomes. So the background of this is I'm going to go over the, what, what I've done and what we do now currently compared to what we used to do back in the day. Scott's going to go over a step-by-step -step rehab program for us. And again, I'm going to do the short-term outcomes and then the, the long-term outcomes. So overall, I began my practice in 1982. And when I started practice, research has always been one of my focuses, mainly because I've been dealing with a lot of teenage athletes and in particular, I remember one of the mothers, when I was in first starting practice, said, my daughter's only 15 years old. What's going to happen to her knee in 20 years? And of course, I said, I, I have no idea. And she goes, well, she's only going to be 35. Is she going to be able to walk? She's going to have an arthritic knee. She's still going to be playing sports. And I said, I don't know. I think I'd like to figure this out. So the goal in research, we had to identify which people had trouble and also which people did well. So we could do both. We could find out who's doing well and why and who's not having good outcomes and why. So we had to study ways of determining good and bad outcomes and ways to improve treatment. In the 1970s, and again, when I first started practice, nobody did ACL surgery acutely because there was not a good way to do it. And our goal was to give people with chronic ACL deficient knees a stable knee. So when people would come in, they'd have knees with full motion, but they were loose as heck. And they complained about falling down all the time. And all they wanted to do was have something be done so their knee wouldn't give out all the time. So we were always doing extra articular procedures because that's what was done in every other joint in the body. And doing extra articulars in the knee seemed like it made sense because that's what Jack Houston in Columbus, Georgia was recommending then. We did medial and lateral extra articulars. We put patients in a cast at 30 degrees of flexion for six weeks to try to let things heal and get stiff. Stiffness was desired because we were trying to take a loose knee and make it into a stiff knee. And we thought that making a stiff knee was better than having a loose knee because that's what the patients wanted. And knee extension past zero degrees was discouraged because if patients maintained a flexion contracture, they were always maintained some stability and knees that got their motion back were considered failures because they were loose. Because of the recurrent failure we had with many people that had more than full extension, more than zero degrees of extension, we started adding intraarticular grafts into the extraarticular procedures, hoping to prevent the extension better than just by the extraarticulars alone. And the rehabilitation wasn't off, wasn't altered at all. We our goal was still to make the knee stable by leaving it what we thought was slightly stiff. But we started doing intraarticular procedures, and the two we started doing were semitendinosus grafts and patellar tendon grafts. But what happened by putting these grafts inside the knee joint, all of a sudden we were having many more stiff knees and they weren't stiff knees. Now they were painful knees. Patients couldn't straighten their knee out, but instead of just being stiff, these patients had painfully flexed, flexed knees. And when they tried to straighten their knee out, it hurt. It wasn't just a tight feeling, it was a painful feeling. So when we look at our goal of ACL surgery, what we're trying to do, and this is simplistic but realistic, we wanna restore stability, but we also want to give the patient a chance to having a symmetric knee compared to the opposite side. It's similar to people when they have hand problems, they look at their right hand and their left hand and they notice a difference. Same thing with knees. They look at their right knee and their left knee and they want them to be symmetric, both in motion, strength, and function. And we wanted to try to get people back to their preoperative uh, strength measurements. And then lastly, which is why the athletes have surgery, they want to get back to the same level of participation that they did when they hurt themselves. 
So essentially what we're trying to do is the ACL surgery should allow patients to regain two normal knees. And I was amazed at how patients came in all the time when I told them they had good results. And they said, no, I don't. And I said, yeah, your knee's nice and stable. And they said, but it's not normal. And I kept thinking about how, 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 how greedy are these patients? They tear their ACL and they want to have a normal knee. Well, if you're a naive 16 year old high school athlete and you tear your ACL and you have surgery, you expect to have a normal knee. Achieving stability was a higher priority than getting motion back and having a stable knee, we thought, I thought was the focus of my surgery, but the patients had less than ideal results because they came in and said, yeah, my knee's stable, but it's not normal. And patients cannot have a normal knee unless extension range of motion is equal to the opposite side. I could not believe how much of a uh, problem a slight flexion contracture was. And by slight, I mean anything not equal to the opposite side. So we needed to have a program to reach surgical and rehabilitation goals. The patellar tendon graft has been what I use forever. I've never used another graft other than a patellar tendon graft in 40 years. It's readily available as two per patient. It's a strong graft. It's viable early. That's the nice thing. We've done biopsies on our patients and there is never a time period after the surgery where the patellar tendon graft is not a viable graft. It's histologically being replaced by fibroblasts. The original graft we put in is slowly being reabsorbed, but being replaced by new cells. So there's never a period of time where the graft is not alive. You have quick bone-to-bone -bone healing. We have a very high success rate. It allows for unrestricted rehabilitation and early return to sports. And I'll go into how we figured that out. That wasn't the goal. It wasn't the idea when I started. And it has the ability to grow back. And again, taking the graft from the opposite side has allowed us to perfect the ability to make the patellar tendon grow back predictably well to the point that it's amazing how when you take the graft from the same knee, you compromise the knee's ability to have the patellar tendon donor site grow back. The button fixation allows for a tight bone uh, tunnel fit. We were trying to figure out when is the graft healed. We did a CT scan at two weeks post-op and you see the cancellous bone in the cancellous bone. It's going crazy. Yeah. There's never been a problem with patients uh, not being able to do things because of healing. The patellar tendon graft solved the stability problem, but we still had trouble getting full range of motion back. So why were the knees becoming stiff and becoming painful? Well, the addition of the intraarticular graft is something that I never realized until we did it. It acted as a mechanical doorstop in the knee. When the knee was stiff with an extraarticular procedure, the joint was tight, but it wasn't painful. When we started putting a graft inside the knee, we realized that the knee is the only joint in the body where there's an intraarticular ligament that can affect both extension and flexion. If the graft is too tight, you can't bend your knee. If it's too big, you can't straighten your knee out. Or if it's not placed in the right spot, you can't straighten the knee out. And this was a development that I had not been taught during my resident or my fellowship, but I learned the hard way in practice because patients were coming in with painful lack of extension. Well, we started doing acute, acute surgery on athletes thinking, why should we wait and let them become chronic when we know they're gonna to need to have surgery? So we started doing surgery as quickly as possible, sort of like somebody with a broken ankle comes in the emergency room, you take them right to surgery. It was common for a patient to have surgery the, the same day as an injury on a Saturday at a football game. Post-operative treatment was not changed. We still put the patient's knee in a cast at six weeks or 30 degrees of flexion, thinking we wanted the bone plugs to heal. And to my eye opener, we had a huge rate of arthrofibrosis, much higher with acute surgery. This is what we charted every year, patients with scar resection. This is not just people that couldn't straighten their knee out. These are people that couldn't straighten their knee out. And it was painful because they couldn't straighten their knee out because there's a mechanical doorstop to extension inside their knee, which is the patellar tendon graft. And the graft is either too big or not positioned properly. The notch is not big enough, but these people couldn't straighten their knee out. And I had to do an operation to allow them to have the doorstop removed to give them a chance of straightening their knee out. And although they were better, they were never perfect. They were never normal. They were never as happy as the people that never had this happen. Something had to be done to keep this from happening. The knees were stable, but rehab was difficult. The patients were miserable and they can't get back to normal activities because they couldn't straighten their knee out and it was painful. As we went through this, it was right about the time Dr. Wilkins was with me, we were experimenting with our rehabilitation, trying to get the motion back without breaking the graft. And the article we published in 1990, 
it indicated that we did not find anything we could do rehabilitation-wise with a patellar tendon graft that essentially would break the graft. So we started pushing the accelerated rehab, means getting the motion back to normal compared to the opposite side. So we got the extension back and then the strength and stability uh, was being maintained and we were preventing anterior knee pain. So the program was developed to prevent range of motion problems after ACL surgery. We still wanted to have stability. We still used a patellar tendon graft. We still wanted to get bone to bone healing, but getting normal extension equal to the opposite side was our biggest goal. And we know that patients weren't happy unless they had that. So that was our goal. Through the years, people thought about the accelerated rehab has been people were going back to sports faster. And that was nothing we intended at all, ever. We wanted to get their motion back quicker because if they never got their motion back, they weren't happy. And we found out if we didn't get their motion back early, their motion wouldn't come back late. And by late, I mean two months or more. So we got the motion back prior to surgery, at the time of surgery, and I'll go over all this. But accelerated rehab means I want to have that patient be able to get their full motion back equally the opposite side as soon as I possibly could. Secondarily, against our advice, patients, when they did this, actually went back to sports faster than I thought was possible, and they did so safely. So the quick return to sports was because you got their motion back. The extension postoperatively allowed the graft to fit in the notch, that we did not have an increase in graft tears, and we learned that immediate full extension gave much better short-term results. And as, as we learned, it also gives better long-term results. So our surgery and rehab has been developed to allow patients to predictably have two knees that are normal. And what we've done is we've been able to achieve this with our current treatment approach. The rehab has evolved over time and we're gonna go over what the accelerated rehab, how it evolved. Our surgery has been proven to correct and we've not changed our surgery in 40 years. I still do an open, uh, patellar tendon graft, I drill the tunnels under direct visualization. I pass, pass the graft from the inside of the knee into the tunnels. And we've been improving the rehab with a data collection through continuous quality improvement. We look at how can we change this? How can we change that? And we've tried to make things slowly better and better and better. And I would bet if Dr. Wilkins came out and visited compared to what he was here, I think I'm doing the same thing, but we're doing a tremendously different program. So we began to make changes in the rehab program. Uh, we stopped using a cast and started using a splint. We started using the CPM machine. We stopped doing extra articular procedures and we kept following the number of people that had a painful scar resection that we had to uh, do surgery on later. And that was our goal is to make that go away and still have good outcomes. When we started looking at the associated injuries, people that had ACLs and MCLs, I was shocked at how much of a uh, factor the MCL led to the painful arthrofibrosis. 30% of these people that had surgery immediately after their injury end up having scar resections and 80% of them had range of motion loss. So we began treating the medial collateral ligament non-operatively and the non-operative treatment, I'll go over this, is by putting the, plate, the patient in a 20 degree cylinder cast. Not only did that make the medial collateral heal better, but it made the patient much more comfortable. So we stopped doing the acute surgery on the medial collateral ligament. I was doing a lot of experimental rehab changes and I was first into practice and I was a little bit concerned about the fact that I'm doing these what was considered radical changes in the rehab. So we reduced the scar resection below 10%, but in 1986, I'm doing enough different things and I was putting people in removable splints and I was trying to make sure I wasn't doing anything dumb so I hired a medical student to retroactively call all the patients from the first three years of my practice to see if people were really doing the rehab program we were asking them to do. And I asked them to say, okay, are they wearing a splint full time? Are they using their crutches full time? Because it was an independent person, I think the patients felt more comfortable about being honest. But what I found out is that most patients would not wear their splint to bed. And the, uh, the student said, Dr. Shelburne, are patients supposed to be wearing their splint full time? I said, oh yeah, 23 hours a day, just take it out an hour a day to work on range of motion. He goes, nobody sleeps in the splint. I said, darn it, I'm gonna have to find out who these people are. And then he said, how about using crutches? I said, oh yeah, crutches full time for six weeks. He goes, nobody I talk to uses crutches inside the house. Well, I looked at the data between the compliant and non-compliant patients thinking I was going to get upset with the non-compliant patients. But it turned out the non-compliant patients were actually doing better. They had better motion, better strength, 
no difference in stability. This was a huge eye opener. I remember at the time I told my brother, who's a football coach, I said, Dave, it looks like that the more patients ignore my advice, the better off they are. And he kept saying, well, why do you make so much money compared to me? Because as a football coach, if my players do that, I get fired. So I began to make even more rehab changes. The accelerated rehab back in the day, we look back on this now and kind of laugh. We started getting full extension the day of surgery, which is, has been continued. But the hospital stayed dropped to two or three days versus five or six days, which was common back in the 80s. Weight bearing is tolerated without crutches. The splint could be discontinued as soon as the patients had leg control. At the time, we started working on strengthening exercises because we were taking the patellar tendon graft from the same knee. And our biggest concern is would stability be maintained? Well, surprisingly, when we look at our KT numbers over the years, the blue is perfect results. The yellow are pretty good results and the red are the bad results. Back in the early part of this rehab, we were doing pretty well, but as we changed our rehab, not only did the motion come back better, but the stability was better. And I kept getting better and better results, probably due to the large volume of ACLs I was doing. The motion, patients benefited, the rehab was easier, the motion gains were less of a problem, the scar resections decreased. We developed a cryo cuff back in the late 80s and we essentially eliminated scar resections about 25 years ago. We continued to make small changes, we delayed the surgery to get full motion back, good leg control. Pre-operative changes were, were also important. Post-operative changes, we kept the patients down. We developed a cryo cuff, kept the knee elevated. We gradually eliminated the need for scar resections, which was our main goal, in addition to having the patients have good results. So the post-op rehab program, we're going to go into this now, and I'm going to have Scott probably do most of this. We tried to look at hyperextension. That was the biggest problem, and I'll, I'll let Scott take over the rehab from here. So this is just a quick overview of the uh, the reason that we really focus on the extension range of motion. We wanted to see does, does hyperextension uh, have negative uh, connotations or or negative results to it. So we did a study looking at patients that had uh, hyperextension, which was six degrees of hyperextension to fifteen degrees, which in, with an average of eight degrees, and compared those to patients that had less hyperextension uh, at a mean of zero degrees. And what we did was. Uh, looked at these results over time. We looked at the KT difference postoperatively and found that there was no difference between the group that had extreme hyperextension versus those that had more minimal hyperextension at a p-value of 0.70 when we ran that study. We also looked at graft tear and failure rates within the five-year postoperative period with group A having a uh, failure rate of 6.9% versus 9.8%. And again, not statistically different on those compared to the two groups. Um, the Activity ratings for these, uh, also, as you can see on the far right column, not any different based on the group A and group B, with, again, group A being the group of maximum hyperextension and group B being the minimum hyperextension. So what we learned from this was there's no increase in graft tear or failure rates based on the hyperextension value, and there's no difference in activity level, function, or stability. So the goal with that one was, or the finding, was to get any extension equal to the other side. So from a rehab standpoint, um, I want to go through some things that we want to hit um, for everyone, but definitely the therapists that are that are in uh, attendance. It really starts preoperatively. And Dr. Shelburne had mentioned that as soon as we see this patient, we start the day you meet them and start working on certain things. The patient presentation for this is they're very discouraged, they're upset, they're stiff, they're swollen, they're painful. All of these things, whether they're more on the psychological side or the objective side, need to be addressed and they need to be normalized prior to surgery. Oftentimes they're going to come in and the patients are going to be emotionally upset. They're going to be discouraged. They know they're going to be out for you know, six months or more from the sport that they love. The best thing to counteract that is education. And at our clinic, we provide quite a bit of education for our patients preoperatively. And that does a great job of setting the stage and, and presenting the patient with the expectation, not only for what their potential outcome will be, what time they're going to get back to a sport, but also what to expect with the surgery, what to expect with the early rehab, the intermediate rehab and the late rehab. The more education they have, typically the better they're gonna do after surgery. The way we structure this in our clinic is with a visit called a preoperative talk and test visit. It's a visit that the therapist sits down with the patient as well as their family and educates them on the surgery, the rehab, what to expect at the hospital, what to expect to get home. That does a really good job of setting up the realistic expectations for the patients as they go into surgery. 
the other thing it does is it allows everybody on the team to get on the same page. We work with multiple disciplines here at our clinic and we want to be on the same page, both with the surgeon, the physical therapist, the athletic trainer, the patient, the caregiver, you name it. Everybody needs to have a good understanding of what's to come to uh, set up those realistic expectations. From an objective standpoint, the patients need to have really four main goals. They need to have full extension equal to the other side, which means if they have 10 degrees of hyperextension on the non-involved side, we need to get that uh, ACL tear side to 10 degrees of hyperextension prior to surgery. They need minimal swelling. Typically, we want to see that as trace or mild. And that really goes hand in hand with goal number three of having nearly full flexion. We want patients to have pretty much equal flexion to the other side. However, with a little bit of swelling, you might see a deviation by about 10 degrees. Our average going into surgery is six degrees off compared to the opposite side. And then from a gait standpoint, we want them uh, really functioning pretty normal. We want them walking normal with a heel to toe gait pattern with normal ter terminal knee extension without the use of any crutches. Once the therapy staff does a good job preoperatively of getting that knee into full motion, then it's up to Dr. Shelbourne to take care of the graft placement and the uh, graft tensioning. And what you see here in this video is he's moving the knee through full hyperextension, through full flexion at the end of surgery. The main reason, and Dr. Shelbourne will probably hit on this later, is to assure that the new ligament fits perfectly inside the notch, which of course cannot be done unless you get full extension prior to surgery. If you do have a limitation in motion at the time of surgery, it's typically due to the fact that the graft is not placed correctly or is too tight. And if you get your range of motion after surgery when a graft that is put in too tight or is misplaced from a tunnel standpoint, the, really the only way to ob obtain full range of motion is to have a graft failure. Uh, so obviously that's a, a bad outcome that nobody wants. So it has to be a good mix of good preoperative motion and good graft placement after surgery. So really no matter what the graft choices or the technique you use, the, the key is having full range of motion at the end of surgery to assure that good long-term result. From an early rehab standpoint, uh, ACL knee range of motion is really key. And we'll talk about those subtle differences with the ipsilateral patellar tendon graft and, and what we use in the contralateral patellar tendon graft. But for the most part, when we're talking about just the ACL side, the key is get the motion back and keep the swelling to a minimum. We use a CPM, a continuous passive motion machine, which you see here. We use it mainly for elevation, but we do have it constantly moved from zero degrees to 30 degrees for range of motion and pain control. We also use a, a cold compression device, a crowd cuff, which you see on the knee there. We wear that at all times, the first week after surgery. The only time they're really not wearing that is when they're going to the bathroom and back, and that does a great job of preventing a hemarthrosis. After surgery, as you see in the video uh, on the right, we want patients to get to full passive knee extension to be able to hold that actively with their quad control. So immediate full extension equal to the other side is the main focus after surgery. And we do that with a variety of uh, exercises. As you can see here, a simple towel stretch. We use a product called the Ideal Knee, which you see in the picture on the left. It's a, it's a great way to maximize knee hyperextension. You can use a heel prop with weight. Whatever you need to do, we want to emphasize that good passive and active terminal knee extension. As you can see in this video of a patient being seen postoperatively, the goal is for every patient to have normal hyperextension equal to the other side. Again, whether that's 10 degrees of hyperextension on the non-involved side or five degrees, whatever the patient has, we want them to get back to that point. The other aspect of the, the rehab in this phase is leg control. As you can see in the video, the patient has perfect leg control, able to fire that quad, get the knee into a hyperextended position and raise the whole leg as a unit. That ensures full extension, and it's also a great way to maintain that leg control and prep for strengthening to come. And the other motion of the knee is flexion. That's going to progress more slowly, mainly due to the fact that there's going to be a little bit of swelling in the knee. And as the swelling goes down over time, the flexion will tend to increase. We're looking for flexion pr uh, progress daily or weekly on this. It's typically not going to be normal for a good two months after surgery, but we want to make sure that we're monitoring the patient, educating them on their swelling and their activity levels to be able to get them to progress to have no normal flexion by about two months. A great way that we monitor these patients at home is we give the patient a yardstick. They put their heel equal with the zero end at the end of the yardstick, and then they're able to bend their knee. And as that translates up, as you can see in the picture there, they're going to get further up on the yardstick and they can tell us when we call them every day, I'm at 30, degree, uh, 30 centimeters, I'm at 40 centimeters, I'm at 50 centimeters. So you know they're progressing throughout that first week. 
The difference between an ipsilateral graft and a contralateral graft, the main difference is we split those two knees into two different goals, with the ACL side having the goals of range of motion and, and swelling control, and the graft having a completely opposite goal of having uh, tendon regeneration and strengthening. So the nice thing about the graft knee is that we're not inside the knee joint at surgery, so we're able to work on this right away without having to worry about any type of swelling. So we start with high repetition, low load exercises, and we have them take a shuttle press home, what you see in this video here. That's an individual sized leg press machine that patients take home, and they really work on that tendon regeneration through high repetition, low load exercises. Another aspect of the early rehab phase is gait. Uh, we really strive to have normal gait, and that means landing on the heel, pushing off through the toe. And that can only be done when the patient has full knee extension. So we push full knee extension early, and then we really train them that first visit after surgery to get that, uh, to, to get that gait as normal as possible. Early on in the rehab, for the first seven days uh, after surgery, the patient's on a relative bed rest period. They're up on their feet only for bathroom privileges and back. They're doing the heel prop exercises, the ideal knee, the flexion exercises. So those motion exercises three times a day. For the contralateral grafts, they're doing the shuttle exercise. Again, high repetition, low load exercises for tendon regeneration for the first week three times a day as well. And then as I mentioned earlier, they're wearing that cryo cuff continually except during the exercises for the first seven days. We track our patients uh, not only for clinical reasons, but for research purposes. And you can see the uh, log sheet here is a, a good example of what we give the patient. We give them seven of these sheets and they track their exercises that they do three times a day throughout those first seven days. It's also a great way to track what medications they're taking, what their pain level looks like. So if we wanna go back from a research standpoint, we can see what those parameters led to different outcomes. Also clinically, our physical therapists uh, have a designated or the patient has a designated physical therapist that they're going to stay in contact with and our therapy staff calls our patients every single day after surgery to check in on them and we use this log sheet as a great way to communicate how they're doing from an outcome standpoint from a rehab standpoint and able to uh, keep in contact and communicate with the therapy staff how they're progressing that first week visit, we see them seven days post-operatively. Our goal is to really have full knee extension already done. So again, if they have five degrees of hyperextension on the non-involved side, we want five degrees at that first week visit. Their uh, flexion should be progressing throughout the week. And we already know that from the therapy staff because we've been calling them throughout the week and seeing what their numbers are on the yardstick. And we wanna see an average of about 110 degrees. From a swelling standpoint, if as long as they're staying down, only get in, getting up to go to the bathroom and back and using the crowd cuff continually, we're gonna see about a trace or mild effusion uh, on that fluid wave test at that first week visit. Their leg control uh, is typically normal uh, because we don't allow them to lose it. That's a big thing with the therapists uh, listening that quad inhibition can, can be an issue after surgery. However, one of the reasons, one of the best ways to treat that is to just not get it. And we typically don't see quad inhibition after, after our uh, surgery because we really harp on it early on to maintain and keep that leg control and really never get to the point where we lose it. And then from a gait standpoint, as we discussed earlier, the goal really is to walk normal without crutches. For the contralateral patellar tendon grafts, we progress the strengthening. You see in the video on the top there, the person doing a step down, we start slowly increasing load, but the goal with the strengthening is really tendon regeneration for the first two months. And we want to focus on high rep and low load exercises. Education is still important for that first week. We really emphasize positive extension habits. As you see in the picture on the right, that patient is shifting the weight to their right side, locking that right knee out. That can only be attained if they have good passive knee extension. So we work on that preoperatively. The graft tunnel placement is perfect to allow us to have uh, a good fit with the graft in the notch. And then after surgery, we educate them that they need to be able to functionally use that knee extension through positive extension habits. We're progressing their flexion. Uh, the third bullet point you see there, they're keeping activity level still to a minimum. They're able to get up, of course, after that first week, but we need to uh, educate them on returning to work, returning to school, and being uh, cognizant of monitoring to their flexion Kevin? to get their swelling to a minimum. Kevin? Yeah. Oh, what's wrong? The uh, uh -huh. cold compression, the uh, cryo cuff has continued to be worn three to five times a day for up to 30 minutes, and the exercises continue three times a day for the first couple of weeks. As the patient progresses with their motion, they start a low impact exercise program at a month when we see them back. That can be something like a bike or elliptical or stairmaster, something of that nature where the patient is um, keeping their foot on a platform to really reduce the, the intensity to keep their swelling to an absolute minimum. 
as they continue to work on the uh, extension and flexion, we eventually get to strengthening on, on both knees, but we need to test that first on the, uh, as the range of motion gains are completed and they have full extension, they have full flexion, the, we're still working on their, keeping their swelling down. They do start to increase the load uh, of that strengthening. As the patient uh, continues to improve, we got to improve or increase the intensity of these strengthening exercises. We focus on open and closed chain exercises and really hit that bilateral strengthening once this uh, limb symmetry index gets within 10%. So 90% or higher, we start the bilateral strengthening exercises. And then the next goal is to get to preoperative strength. That can only be done through testing. We measure through isokinetic Cybex testing, which you see in the picture there. The first goal is to get limb symmetry within 10%. And then the second goal is to be 90% or higher compared to preoperative normal. By the end of the intermediate phase and before progressing back, patients back into sports, they need to have symmetric range of motion, no swelling, symmetric quads within 10%, and about 80% or higher on a preoperative strength standpoint, and obviously no pain with activity. The principles with this late stage rehab is you got to progress and, and have a progressive overload principle and, and progress their intensities while you're still monitoring their tolerance to activity. And you can do that through flexion and swelling. And this is a good chart here to show how we progress our patients in the late rehab phase. You start with individual predictable submax activities. You progress your intensity as your effort reaches its full max. And then you go to unpredictable activities. You start at a low intensity. And then as you see with number four there, you progress your intensity to 100. And then once you can uh, tolerate 100% effort with unpredictable drills, you move into practice and eventually moving into games. And the biggest thing, again, from the, for the therapy staff is to monitor the patient at each stage. And if you do have to slow the progression or go back to a previous stage, completely okay. We just need to make sure they're tolerating whatever activity they're at. Okay. A, little, a little bit different than most people. We used patellar tendon grafts, but we started switching to this back in 1994. And the reasoning at times, when I had ipsilateral patients go back to play and they tore their op tore their ACL again, I had to use a contralateral patellar tendon graft for the revision surgery. And it turned out that the revision surgery had a much better uh, outcome than the primary surgery, motion and strength and symmetry. And the patients always told me that the second surgery was a lot easier than the first one. And they asked me at the time, said, why don't you do it like this in the first place? So in 1994, if I had patients that needed to get back to activities quicker than normal, I figured, okay, if you want to get back quicker, I'll start using the contralateral graft. And I kept thinking, okay, who doesn't want to get back quicker? So we started doing it in everybody for about the last 20 years. The goals of the rehabilitation, as Scott was talking about, the ACL knee, you want to prevent a hemarthrosis and get motion back. And then the donor site, you want to get strength back with a lot of high repetition exercising. And these are contradictory philosophies. The donor site, we're trying to figure out a way to work on getting the tendon stimulated. And this shuttle press is something that people can do like a leg press with uh, bungee cords at their home. When we looked at the difference between ipsilaterals and contralaterals, there was no difference in stability, but the motion and strength was a huge difference. And this is the the bottom on the bottom. Uh, the yellow line is the recovery after surgery. You see the ipsilateral graft, the patient's uh, strength returns are very, very slow, but the ACL reconstructed leg is always uh, very, very weak compared to the normal leg. When you take the graft on the opposite side, it actually makes the donor site the weaker side, but they have more of a symmetric uh, strength recovery. When we looked at overall uh, down the road, the, the uh, ability to, re to maintain or obtain symmetry was a lot better with the contralateral grafts. And so overall, getting the extension back is now very, very predictable because that's all we're trying to work on with the ACL leg. We're not trying to do anything with uh, strengthening and overall getting the motion back in the ACL leg now can be our goal. So through this, we've collected our data and Scott, if we have time, can show you our research. We have a uh, BI dashboard that has all of our data from all of our patients for over the 40 years. If you look at the short-term outcomes after ACL surgery, our goal is to get everybody to have full extension. And full extension means within two degrees of the opposite side. So if you have eight degrees of hyperextension, five degrees of hyperextension is not normal. When you look at our uh, flexion, our flexion comes back uh, better, but not as quickly. But the average flexion of one week is 110 degrees. At two weeks is 122. 
we never have a patient have a quad shut down or a heme arthrosis or inability to bend past 90 degrees. When we look at our strength overall, taking the graph from the opposite side has allowed the symmetry to be much, uh, much quicker. And interestingly, at two months post-op, patients prefer their ACL reconstructed leg because it feels more normal. And psychologically, that is a fabulous thing for us. When you look at our return to sports, it's a little bit quicker for the kids under 18. But again, the return to sports, we don't re restrict the return based on anything from a time perspective. Uh, we just do it based on how, how the knee is looking. If you look at our ability to return to level 10 is competitive college or pro, nine is competitive high school, and eight is recreational sports. Almost 100% of our patients get back to the sport that they uh, really want to. When you look at the ability to get back before or after six months, most patients get back before six months, and the retail rate is no different based on returning to sports. Subjective scores over time, it's a uh, pretty darn good. In the sh short term, we've done a great job. But more importantly for us now is looking at long-term outcomes because if patients don't get their motion back, but their knees are stable, you pat them on the back, say, ah, oh, heck, you'll, you'll be fine. So when we looked at our data from our patients up until uh, minimum 10-year follow-up, we have 3,382 patients met the criteria. We have physical exam follow-up x-rays on 883 patients at minimum of 10 years and another 880 at uh, subjective. So we have 1,762 patients at more than 10 years. If you look at the overall uh, ability to maintain full extension, again, this was back in the 80s and 90s. We didn't focus on it enough. Patients at more than 10 years, 83% of them have perfect extension and 78% have perfect flexion. Unfortunately, patients are six times uh, more likely to have normal extension long term if they had it at two months. And two months lacking extension seems to be a big period of time that's a cutoff. When you look at our, uh, the uh, IKDC scores based on range of motion, if you look back on everybody, they score in the 80s, meniscus tears, chondral injuries, meniscus tears, and chondral injuries. But if you separate out normal extension and abnormal extension, there's a huge difference if you look at the abnormal extension and if you look at patients that have meniscus tears and chondral injuries, if they have full extension, they're much better off than people that have nothing wrong that have a flexion contracture. If you look at IKDCs, people with normal extension, 72% are normal, abnormal extension, 42%. And again, that's significant tremendously. If you look at the strength, if you look at overall strength, it's pretty darn good on, on all groups. But if you separate out the people with normal extension and abnormal extension, there's a huge difference. If you look at osteoarthritis, 15% of patients have moderate to severe osteoarthritis at the average of 17 years. If you look at the number of people with arthritic knees, you expect them to get a little bit worse as they have more injuries. But if you separate out people with normal extension and abnormal, if you look at people that have, if you look at the last column, meniscus tears and chondral injuries, 18% of them have moderate to severe osteoarthritis if they have full extension, but 46% of them have moderate to severe if they don't. And the uh, difference between the patients in all these groups, if you don't look at extension, is huge. Same thing with meniscus tears, people that have uh, normal menisci and people that have repairs and remove, they have much better uh, outcomes and x-rays if they have normal extension compared to if they don't. So it is a significant, the odds of having an osteoarthritic knee is five times higher if you don't have full extension. And that's much more than if you have a meniscus tear or chondral injuries. So focusing on meniscus tears and chondral injuries at the time of surgery is okay, but you can't do it unless you maintain and obtain full extension compared to the opposite side. And many times you put people on crutches after treating them for meniscus tears and chondral injuries. So overall, osteoarthritis is more significantly affected by lack of extension than meniscus tears and chondral injuries. So the goal right now is to try to give people the best chance of having the best knee down the road. And that means if you have a choice, get full extension back first. You can treat chondral injuries and meniscus tears, but not at the expense of extension. So thank you. And we have time for questions now, I think. Don and Scott, thank you very much. That was very enlightening. It was, as I was listening to this talk, Don, you know most of this audience wasn't even born yet when you were doing contralateral ACLs. So. <laughs> Probably true, John. <laughs> and um, and I think you know people look at trends in ACL surgery. You've taken your data, your patients, 
and follow them. If you can't measure them, you can't make it better. So I applaud you and your staff for, for doing this. I mean, I think there's more research here than a lot of your um, registries and the moon and the Mars, they're all wonderful because uh, they kind of share multiple experiences, but you focus on just trying to make your procedure and your outcome better. And I, I again, it's, I, I would, your numbers, I would share with, uh, we'll put up against anybody and, um, and you should be, you and your staff should be applauded. I have two quick questions for Scott or Don. Uh, you talked about meniscus tears and do you change your rehab then a little bit because of meniscus repairs? And then the other question is, if you guys introduce BFR into your rehab? Uh, two things. No, we don't change anything with meniscus tears. And the interesting thing, if you look at the meniscus tears that occur with ACL tears, they're a totally different ball game because in general, if you know you have a meniscus tear and it's symptomatic, then it, you can't really repair it. And the ones that you can treat successfully at the time of ACL surgery are totally asymptomatic. They have no joint line tenderness. They have negative McMurray's. They, you find them at the time of ACL surgery. And we've slowly, well, first of all, we repaired most of these menisci uh, suture wise, but then we didn't want to restrict the motion. Well, it turns out you don't need to restrict motion. Weight bearing actually encourages healing of a meniscus tear. We almost never repair meniscus tears now. We either leave them alone or tree find them. Uh, blood flow restriction, actually, is, it's funny. We don't have a problem with strength at all after ACL surgery because we don't have range of motion problems. Scott, Scott can talk about this, but it's, it's unique. We don't strengthen the ACL leg. We just get the motion back and the strength comes back without doing anything. As Dr. Shepard was saying, from an ACL knee standpoint, he's 100% correct. We hardly ever strengthen that side. So then your question should be geared at, well, could you use BFR for the for the graft side? And I think in principle, maybe, but um, the shorter answer is no, we don't use that. You know, BFR, the whole point of using that is to, to mimic uh, lower intensities through restricting of the blood flow to try to maximize strength gains. Um, which we are trying to do high repetition and low load for that low intensity aspect of it. But we focus so much on the, the low load aspect uh, through the shuttle press and the knee extensions and whatever exercise we're going to do. We're really hitting tendon regeneration versus strengthening. So we really don't see any problems with uh, the, the, our current mechanisms for strength gain and tendon regeneration to the point where we really haven't uh, introduced BFR. John, I think the interesting thing, if you feel like BFR is necessary or helpful, I would bet you're doing it because the patient doesn't have full extension. Because it seems like people that have flexion contractures can't use their leg properly. They can work 30 minutes a day in the gym, but 23 hours a day, they favor their leg. I saw John Shipley. Do you have a question? Actually, I'm going to ask it for him, John. Um, okay. So, Scott, the question was, can you clarify what you mean by never getting quad inhibition? Lots of talk these days on how both the ACL injury and surgery cause quad shutdown inhibition. So how has your team really prevented that? Well, then prevention is the fact that we prevent swelling. And if you pre prevent the hemarthrosis, uh, that plays a, a hemarthrosis plays a, a lot into quad inhibition and, and quad shutdown. So if you uh, uh, really reduce the incidence of getting that tense, severe uh, hemarthrosis, you're not going to have a hot, whole lot of quad shutdown. Plus the fact that we we um, perform the contralateral grafts uh, the majority of the time, you're really reducing that surgical trauma. Uh, so you're not having the ACL reconstruction as well as the graft harvesting from the same knee. So you reduce the trauma with that. You're not having the extensor mechanism uh, insult on the ACL side. So I think for those couple of reasons, we really reduce that. Uh, not to mention, as Dr. Shelburne said, before surgery, we really focus on maximizing their knee extension range of motion. So if you have maximum knee extension range of motion, you can maximally and forcefully get to that terminal knee extension. Whereas if you don't have that and you can't force your knee into full extension, you're not really firing your quad on all cylinders. So I think the quad shuts down more easily. So it, it's hard to answer with just one reason. I really think it's multifactorial with preoperative knee extension range of motion, uh, preventing hemarthrosis and this uh, re reduction in surgical insult.
One thing I will mention that Scott uh, hasn't mentioned, and John, I, I have a, a nice office set up and that I have nine physical therapists that work with me and they just take care of patients with knee problems and they just take care of my patients. So every patient has their own therapist. So when they come in to see me, the therapists work with me in clinic. The therapist takes them out of the waiting room, puts them in shorts, takes their history, gets x-rays, presents them to me, and then we see the patient together. And so the patient has their own therapist in addition to me taking care of them. And after the surgery, when patients go home the next day, I keep them overnight to make sure they don't get a hemarthrosis. They go home the next day, the therapists call them every single day because it's their patient. And we prevent, it, prevent things more than try to treat them if they happen. And Don, along those lines, can you share um, what the typical pain management is for these, for these kids or for your patients? Well, interesting, if you talk about pain management, we, we, we don't have people have pain. You know, we, we keep them overnight in the hospital. We inject Marcaine in the soft tissues at the end of the procedure. They're on IV ketorolac or Toradol while they're in the hospital, and they're on their back in bed with their legs up in the air. The only thing that's uncomfortable for them is when they go to bend their ACL reconstructed knee. And then they go home and they take Tylenol and a leave, and we give them 20 tramadol, but I've never had to re, 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 refill that. And so patients, I think, just take Tylenol and a leave at home. And the only thing that really hurts is when they do their exercises and they don't have to hurt themselves. I think doing things as an outpatient is a setup for a quad shutdown, a hemarthrosis, painful knees. Doing things as an outpatient after ACL surgery, to me, uh, you lose the big opportunity to prevent a hemarthrosis. We keep people in the hospital, elevation, cryo cuff. The next morning we see everybody, they don't have any swelling in their ACL leg. They can bend at 110 degrees. And the only discomfort they have is when they try to bend their ACL leg because it drops the second and third day and we tell them, don't try to bend it as much as you could the first day because it's going to hurt. And they don't. So they bend 110 degrees the first day, 100 the second day, 90 the third day, and then back to 110 by one week. Another question is, what is your protocol and how is it different for somebody who has had a multi-ligament injury like an ACL and a PCL together? What kind of multi-ligament injury are you are you talking about? If you have a medial side knee dislocation or a lateral side is the different medial side knee dislocations are ACL, MCL, PCL. Okay, and what we do with those, the MCL can heal and the PCL can heal. So if somebody has a medial side knee dislocation, I put them in a 20 degree cylinder cast so they can bear weight. The MCL heals, the PCL heals. We change the cast every week. And on proximal MCLs, they have to have a cast for one to two weeks. Distal MCLs, it might be three to four weeks. By that time, then the PCL and the MCL have healed. Then you get the range of motion back and electrically we do the ACL if you need to. On the lateral side knee dislocations, you can either have lateral side ACL, lateral side ACL, and PCL. The main structure on the lateral side of the knee that needs acute surgery is putting the lateral capsule back to the tibia. You don't need to do anything fancy on the lateral side. The lateral capsule pulls off the tibia. It elevates proximal to the joint along with the lateral meniscus. Acutely, within two weeks, take that staple back to the tibia right behind Gertie's tubercle. Then ignore the PCL because it'll heal. Let the ACL go. Get the motion back and electively do the ACL down the road if you need to. Knee dislocations are tremendously overly treated because the simplicity of how to take care of them is not recognized. Well, Donna, I want to thank you and Scott again for uh, getting up early and sharing your experience and history with us. I, again, I think this is an important perspective for everyone um, and what is achievable um, if you focus your energies on what's uh, what's important, what's not important. So, uh, again, I thank you. And if um, Don and Scott have got their information there. So if you have any other questions, certainly uh, they're very accessible. Give them a call or give them a um, 
send them an email and they'll be, I'm sure they'll be happy to follow up with you. But again, Scott and Don, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, John.